Okay, so um, jumping in from everything we talked about, uh, we're in the middle of uh, packaging things into a framework because um, everybody wants to build their own, remember? Um, so test grouping, uh, what that looks like and why it's important. Um, so it's metadata, and in JUnit, you can apply categories, and, uh, and that enables you to basically flexibly create test packs. So you can actually have of all your tests, you could say, I want this test in this file, and this test in this file, and this test in that file, and dynamically you can just pull those out with using categories. And uh, some category ideas, aside from the standard uh, work in progress tag, uh, there's also ignore, tag, uh, ignore annotations in J in it. But you can denote which things are business critical, or smoke, or sanity tests. And uh, I try to group these just for ease of naming into things that are shallow and deep. Like functionality that's very much just like the initial things that are important in the test or in, in your application. So like logging in. It's like you want to make sure the server's up, but just seeing the home page isn't enough. You need to make sure you can actually like authenticate. Uh, or it could be your actual critical stuff. Can I make an initial purchase on this app? Or the deep test, the longer running tests that exercise all these additional permutations and really get into some complexity. Um, so that way what you could do is create uh, a test pack that just exercises the smoke to make sure things are up and running, or the business critical, or the longer running tests. And you can do that dynamically. Um, I've also seen people use story numbers for the features that, they, that were built. And so that what they could do is um, they say, hey, we have a release going out. Let's take all the story numbers and run a suite of tests that use all of the tests that are tagged with story numbers. So you can actually dynamically create a suite that only exercises tests that were written against the release you just wrote that's going out. Um, for more info on JUnit categories, check out that. Um, that goes to the documentation. Um, it's super easy. Uh, that's right, I don't have the slide for that on this. Um, but basically, you just create an, uh, you create an interface for each category, and then you use that in, in the annotation. It's very simple. Uh, the documentation explains it. <coughs> um, so once you have all that, then you're ready to add in cross-browser execution. Ideally, you're, you know, now your, things are, your tests are running uh, in parallel uh, with flexible execution. So we want to run them on different browsers. So there's all these different browser drivers. So if you say, all right, I just want to run them locally, cool. So here is the beginning of your adventure. Uh, you need to go and download a browser driver for each browser you care about. Uh, in Selenium 2, things got re-architected since um, the Selenium RC code base, well, now Selenium uh, and Selenium WebDriver merged together and, the, and things changed. Um, in order to use Selenium with other browsers, they have what's called a browser driver. And the idea is it is a binary that is managed and maintained by browser vendors, ideally. So the Chrome driver is supported by Google. Uh, Firefox by Mozilla, IE driver by some dude named Jim Evans, who's a volunteer, <laughs> who used to work at Microsoft. Uh, and, uh, and he's done a fantastic job. It's a Herculean effort to reverse engineer a browser that uh, is more or less proprietary code uh, and build something functional in a language that he was not familiar with, C++. So, uh, but more recently, since um, the Selenium project is uh, progressing towards a, a World Wide Web Consortium standardization, uh, Microsoft is on board. So they have now actually said, we're going to support a Selenium implementation. We're going to support Internet Explorer and probably Spartan, but only the newer versions. So like IE 11 and on um, is going to be supported by Microsoft and everything preceding that by Jim Evans. Um, Opera Driver, uh, <laughs> who here tests with Opera? Probably. Two people, cool. That's that's probably that's about accurate. So in Selenium, the fun fact: um, after version 12.16, you don't have to uh, actually get a separate driver because if you're testing in Chrome, you effectively get uh, get Opera for free because Opera changed their backend to use the same thing as Chrome. So um, what that would look like if you wanted to uh, set something up, you have to download one of these binaries, whichever browser you care about. Clearly, if it's IE driver, you need Windows, but um, for Chrome, for example, you can download the browser driver, and then you have to either tell Selenium where it is or add it to your system path. And then once you do that, then you can run things in Chrome. But for Firefox, you just get it. It just works. Um, but for everything else, you have to do some additional setup. But the really cool stuff is when you want to run things scalably in a big grid. So it's one thing to write your tests and get them working locally, but you want to run them really fast on a bunch of machines using hardware, using computers for what they're good at. 
So you can use a grid, so you can have your tests, and then you can have a hub which controls and coordinates a bunch of nodes. And then those nodes each have browsers installed on them. So what you could do then is say, I want to run all of my tests on uh, Internet Explorer 8 and Windows XP. And if you have all of those, you have, if you have a bunch of Windows XP machines with IE8 installed, and all of them are using the grid setup, uh, the grid hub will know how to find them and throw tests to them. So uh, this is all done using the Selenium standalone server, uh, which is a Java jar file. Uh, and it just requires some additional runtime flags to make it run as a grid hub or a grid node. Um, and what that looks like for the hub would be java-jar, the file, and then the role. So dash role hub. And then for nodes, it would just be, uh, the role would be dash role node. Then you'd point to the hub. Uh, and so whatever the actual uh, path to it is, so in this example, I'm running this, both of these locally. Uh, and then it would be slash grid slash register. And then you could view, uh, view the grid console in the web and see what nodes you have and what browsers you have access to. And in order to configure your tests, you have to do some additional setup, but it's not much. You have to use what's called desired capabilities. And this is how you tell Selenium which browser and OS combination and platform you want to use. And then you use Selenium remote uh, and pass in the URL to your grid and the capabilities you just configured. And for more info on Selenium Grid, I have a bunch of links. I think that's all of them. Um, so there's, of course, the Selenium Grid docs, which, um, depending on your use case, may not be enough, maybe enough to get started. Um, I have a write-up on just the basic tenets of um, setting up Selenium Grid and some of the additional configuration options. And then there's two fantastic open source libraries, which most people don't seem to know about. Um, and they're written by humans uh, who work at companies who do Selenium Grid at scale. Um, Selenium Grid Extras is a library that was written from someone at Groupon, Dima Kovalenko, who's also an author of a uh, Selenium book that's really good. Uh, he wrote Selenium Grid Extras, and what it does is it helps take care of some of the onerous setup for machines and helps monitor and uh, reboot processes, reboot machines to make sure that your grid remains fresh, and it also does video capture. It just, like, just does it. It's really cool. And then uh, Marcus Morell, who works at Retail Me Not in Austin, Texas, uh, did him and his team did Selenium Grid Scaler, which uh, if you end up using um, Amazon Web Services and this library, ta-da, you have a Selenium Grid farm. <laughs> it's, that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, and it does fantastic auto scaling. It's, it monitors the health, and it determines how much load you're saturating on the Selenium grid. And if it needs more machines, it just knows to spin them up and does it for you. And then it shuts them all down when it's done. It's fantastic. So worth a look. And of course, there's providers like Sauce Labs or BrowserStack, which enable you to just point your tests at their grid. Because uh, under the hood, they're just using Selenium Grid. But then they add a whole bunch of fancy stuff on top. They do video recording. They give you a bunch of test reporting. And, and they just handle all the infrastructure for you know, the fee they charge. So it's very similar, except you just say, hey, there, there's the grid, Sauce Labs. And then they give you a browser. <laughs> the end. That's it. Um, and to set them up, it's the same thing. You just use desired capabilities. And then you specify a whole bunch of stuff. The only difference is. Their endpoint for their grid is behind basic auth, so you have to specify your username and access key, and then everything else is the same. Uh, there are some additional considerations. Uh, you do need to make sure you can find a dynamic way to set the test name, because otherwise it won't list the test name for the test in their job. You also need to find a way to set the pass-fail status on their stack, on their cloud. Otherwise, you'll basically see unnamed test with undefined finished status. <laughs> so it's not super helpful unless you actually open it and know exactly what it maps to. But those are actually fairly trivial to configure, but you just have to know that you have to do them. Um, and then, of course, if you have an application that's hard to reach because it's behind a firewall or whatever it is, um, Sauce Labs has a secure tunnel, which solves a huge headache, right? You can basically, if, if it, your uh, application is running locally and you want to run the tests in Sauce Labs, you can set up a secure tunnel between your machine and Sauce Labs, run the tests, and it just magically connects and does all that. Um, so you can find out more on Sauce. Um, they have a list of all the different platforms that they provide. They also do stuff with mobile as well. Um, I think there's an arms race in terms of who's going to offer real device uh, mobile testing first really well. And Sauce is in that race if, if you're interested in mobile. Uh, and then I have 
there's a post here that to check out in terms of how to use Sauce. And of course, uh, there's a tutorial that they have as well. Fairly extensive documentation. And, and just for the curious, um, if you can see on the washed out colors, but this is basically the recap job of a test that ran. When you, when you actually pass in the correct name, pass in the, the, the test status, and it has all the screenshots, and then it has access to the screencast, Selenium log, and any of the metadata you use to actually run the test. And it also has all the commands that were issued. So pretty helpful. Just basically, it's free HTML reporting with a ton of additional stuff. So you could do that, or use one of those open source libraries I mentioned to try and get the same thing, because you get video recording with Selenium Grid Extras. And the next step um, in, in my 10-step program, um, build an automated feedback loop. So really, this is kind of the most important piece. After we've done all the other really, really important pieces that should not be neglected, <laughs> uh, now we want to make sure we build an automated feedback loop, because the reason we do all of this is not so we can run the test locally and find issues and then run over to the development team and say, hey, this is broken, fix it. It's not that, it's to build uh, an automated feedback loop that goes over to the developer and tells them, hey, it's broken, fix it, <laughs> like as early as possible in, in the cycle. And so, uh, right, the goal, find failures early and often, but you wanna do this with continuous integration and notifications. And who here knows what continuous integration is? Oh, that's fantastic. Who here uses continuous integration for automated testing? Uh, it's, it's, it's a little weak. Okay, we could do better. Um, so <clears throat> continuous integration enables you to do a whole bunch of things. Um, but the most important one to remember for this is it enables you to create a job that you can automatically have run. It can run your automated tests for you, and you can ideally plug it into the development workflow that's happening to build features. So once that job runs, depending on the status, say it fails, say the test run, they find a legitimate failure, you would like them to notify people on the team. And you can do that by sending out email, chat, SMS, whatever it is. There's numerous different ways to do it, and it's very easy to set up. Or you can do things that end up in the dev pit, things that are uh, audio, visual, or public shaming. Uh, some very common ones include <laughs> Uh, uh, glowing orbs or street signs that go from green to red or uh, talking rabbits that have a glowing tummy that actually scrape the commit logs and shout people's names that broke the build. Um, I've seen them all. Uh, <laughs> they do exist. So there's a numerous ways to have fun with it and really make sure that everybody feels welcome on the team. So, um, but really, um, I have this kind of workflow in my head, and the companies that I think are really successful at test automation are doing some variation of this. And what that looks like is code gets committed. Feature code gets committed to the code base. And then the unit in integration tests are automatically run on the continuous integration server. And if they pass, then there's a deployment that happens to a server that's dedicated, an environment that's dedicated to automated testing. There's no manual testing happening here. It's only for automated testing. And if that deployment is successful and the server comes alive, you can run your automated tests. And this, again, could just be a subset. It could be your critical smoke tests, your business critical tests, the ones that ideally is just really the, you know, your fast feedback tests that really matter. They tell you if something legitimate and valuable to the business is broken. And if they pass, then you can deploy to the next environment whether that's a manual testing environment, user acceptance testing, or staging, or even just straight to production if you're feeling a little adventurous. Um, but if you can accomplish something like this, then I think you're accomplishing something very worthwhile, and you're definitely using automation the way it's intended to be do done for testing. And of course, notify the team if any of these conditions aren't met. And ideally, you want everyone to care about it. The hardest part about doing all of this is trusting that the notifications are legitimate, that the test failures are legitimate because that's the fastest thing that will break. The, the trust will erode and people will start to ignore these notifications. But the best way to get them to not ignore them is to stop the line. Make it so no work can be done until these are fixed. Make it so this is actually something that is feature critical. Consider this to be as important as the, any next business request that comes in. This ha like in order to do this well, that's, that's a requirement. So a real simple CI configuration in Jenkins, uh, after you have a Jenkins server, you create a job, 
you configure it to pull in your test code, and then you set up build triggers. It can either be scheduled runs, uh, but that's not usually the best. You want something dynamic that's triggered to the development workflow. So if it's actually, uh, if this is the same CI server as your development team, then you can trigger it based on other jobs that they have running. And then you configure build steps. So for, for, the, for a Maven project, you just specify all the runtime flags you want. And then you configure your test reports. Configure how it consumes all the JN XML, which you get that basically by default. There's no real additional overhead to do there. But if you're dealing with consuming uh, HTML report with screenshots, then maybe there's a plugin you need to install. But that's usually the only uh, level of effort you really need to put in with Jenkins. Whatever you're trying to do, there's probably a plugin for it. And then set up notifications. Again, plugins, if, there's, if, it's, um, if you're using something like Slack or HipChat, then there's a plugin that just will pipe failure notifications directly to your team. And then run the test and view the results. Make sure it works. And then just sit back and keep monitoring. Make sure that the tests run when you think they will, and make sure that you, you get the results you expect. And if not, revisit the test and make sure that they work. And then, of course, high five your neighbor. Yes, that's right. It's important. High fiving is probably the next most important thing after getting this right. Um, you you want to make sure you celebrate your successes. Um, so, the last part of this is really um, how to find information on your own. And I've this is a whole separate talk, um, and so it's not necessarily worth me digging into here. Um, at this link, I have the slides from it, and this is the video recap from uh, Selenium Comp in India last year when I gave the talk. Um, so, so that's that. And I actually have another set of slides to talk about kind of more advanced tips and tricks, um, and or I can show you a mobile testing robot, whichever you want to dig into. So. Um, so just to recap real quickly, um, there's 10 steps that I covered that are, I think, the steps required to solve automated testing, to solve your Rubik's Cube. So define a test strategy, pick a programming language, use Selenium fundamentals, write your first test, and then make it reusable and maintainable and keep writing tests using this kind of one-two punch, and then make your test resilient using effective weighting, and then package things up into a framework adding cross-browser execution, either locally in a grid, someone else's grid, however you end up doing it, and then build an automated feedback loop with all of that, and then find information on your own, which you can check those slides uh, to figure that out. Um, and that's pretty much it to what it takes to write business valuable tests that are reusable, maintainable, and resilient across all relevant browsers, and then package them up for you and your team. Um, so I'll close with this quote for, for this. Um, you may think your puzzle is unique, but really, everyone is trying to solve the same puzzle. Yours is just configured differently, and it's solvable. Uh, and you can quote me on it. <laughs> um, so there's two things. I wrote a book that goes into all these concepts in detail. Um, but really, the thing that I, I mean, I put a ton of work in these books. But the thing I'm really excited about is these uh, weekly tips I do, which I don't have a slide for, um, elementalselenium.com. Uh, free weekly tips on how to use Selenium like a pro. Um, so, uh, and so some of those tips I brought with me. So let me show them to you real quick. Okay. Who's ready for some tips? All right. Okay, good. Um, so as I mentioned, elementalselenium.com. Uh, and uh, you get an email every Tuesday with a tip. Uh, and they're all written against the internet, um, which has something like 35 or 40 different examples uh, of common functionality you find on the web, both um, well-designed and poorly designed, uh, intentionally poorly designed, because that's pretty common when you deal with automated testing. Um, so I get a lot of questions about headless testing. Um, how do I make my tests run maybe on a continuous integration server that doesn't have a monitor, it's just on, has, it's, uh, it's a Linux machine? Or how do I make, make my test run faster using headless testing? So there's a couple of different ways to make your test run uh, so you don't see what's happening. Um, so one of them is to use a virtual frame buffer, uh, which is very common on Linux machines, uh, specifically Unix machines. Um, so a quick primer. Uh, XVFB is short for X virtual frame buffer. And it's an in-memory display server for Unix-like operating systems uh, for Ease of use will say Linux because it's very, it's not very easy to do on Mac, uh, and forget about it on Windows. But assume you're running Jenkins on a Linux machine. 
Uh, it enables you to run graphical applications like a browser uh, without a display. And uh, it gives you the ability also, you can take screenshots from it. So with XVFB, there's three ways to set it up. Option one, um, you actually start the XVFB on, uh, in the background. And then you specify a display value uh, as an environment variable, then you run your script. And, in this, and a lot of these examples, I apologize for the Java people, but most of these are in Ruby, because um, that's majority of the development I've done in, over the years. And uh, so I pulled from all of the tips I've written over the last two years, and most of them are Ruby. Um, and then there's actually a binary that you can use to run uh, your command using XVFB, so you don't have to start it in the background. Uh, and so this will actually take care of just doing it for you, and then it will close down XVFB afterwards. And option three is, if you're using Ruby, there's actually a library, uh, there's a gem that handles it for you. And if you're curious what that looks like, it looks like this. Um, you basically require the gem, uh, and then you start the headless uh, service, and then you destroy it when you're done. And then that also gives you headless testing. It's great if you're just doing like one off. I want to have, um, I'm not using a grid yet. I'm not there. But I want to run on a different machine that's not my local. That's kind of the use case for doing something like this. Um, but there's a better use case for headless, something like Ghost Driver. A lot of people use this because it's faster. So if you say, I've got Selenium tests, and they're still not fast enough. Um, maybe you're not using a grid. Maybe you're just running them locally. But really, what you uh, a lot of people might um, might not know this, but you can actually run using Phantom JS, which is a purely JavaScript full stack browser that renders uh, renders pages as if it's a browser. So it's effectively WebKit. It's kind of like Chrome, like a lightweight version of Chrome. Um, and so there's Ghost Driver, which is built in to Phantom JS. So basically the Selenium bindings are available in PhantomJS. So what that looks like is you download PhantomJS, and then you start it using a web driver flag, dash dash web driver, specify a port, and then you connect your test to it using Selenium Remote. Remember Selenium Remote, we talked about it for Selenium Grid, um, but you can also connect PhantomJS to a Selenium Grid. You can actually have it be an available browser if you want it. Um, but really the, the advantage is uh, for local test execution for speed. Uh, and also, you could spin up, if you wanted to, an entire grid of them. And you could probably, I think it's more performant to the, to the point where you can actually spin up uh, dozens, if not at least 100 Phantom JS instances on one machine if you really wanted to go full tilt on leveraging your hardware and getting faster feedback. But there are issues um, that won't be found using a headless browser like this. There's still, it's not the same thing as running Chrome, and it's definitely not the same thing as running Firefox. But if you're just testing general functionality for the most part, then you can get most of the way there. You can get fast feedback for, for a good chunk of your tests. But to do testing properly, you need to go and have a whole ecosystem. But for, for fast feedback on a few pieces of testing, a headless is a good way to go. And um, yeah, so this is just the Ruby example for doing remote. Um, status codes. I mentioned don't be clever with Selenium. Um, but it's worth at least showing you how to do it <laughs> so you know maybe whether or not you should do it. Um, within Selenium, you can connect a proxy server to your tests. So there's a few different tips here that have to do with proxy servers. One of them is HTTP status codes. Um, so you can use a proxy server to capture the traffic that your Selenium tests generate, and then you can reach into it and find the status code you're interested in. For example, if you're visiting a URL, you can grab that URL and say, hey, did this return a 200 status code? Uh, and then you can assert that status code is what you expected. So in order to configure that, you would need to configure Selenium, the, specifically the browser, to have a profile that uses a proxy server. And then it will, your test will run through that proxy server to reach the application under test. And uh, one of the most popular, if not the most popular, proxy server for Selenium usage is browser mob proxy. And what it looks like is uh, you create an instance of the proxy by starting it. And then you create a profile object. In this case, we're using Firefox. And then you just specify the Selenium proxy. And then feed it into your instantiation of Firefox. And then there's some additional setup here. Um, we actually need to create a HAR file, which is short for HTTP archive. And 
Then uh, afterwards, we want to grab the response status code. So in this run block, we're, we're saying, get this URL. And, we're, and we are getting returned the status code. And then we're expecting that the status code is, e is uh, equal to 404. And in this example on the internet, I have a status codes pages. So each URL you visit, if it's 404, it'll return a 404. If it's 500, it'll return a 500. And so, so on and so forth. So in this example, we're going to a page we know is going to return a 404. And we want to assert that it does. So another thing uh, to use proxy servers for, probably a better use case for a proxy server, is to blacklist content. Um, things that are slow loading on the site, to be, like that are outside of your control. And so to do that, you would manipulate the traffic of your Selenium tests. And so basically what you can do is identify third party resources that are slow, uh, and then just blacklist them using regular expressions. Basically you can take and identify what this resource is. So for example, uh, if it's just all Facebook things, all Facebook ads on this page, you can basically force them to 404 so they don't even try to load. And that could dramatically speed up your tests. And so what that would look like is, is all the same setup with the exception of this blacklist command here. Uh, so we're doing a regular expression to match a URL for this slow loading external resource and forcing it to 404. And then uh, it's just a standard status code check just like before, but this time it's actually doing what we expect. It's Loading in the slow, uh, we're asserting that the slow external resource actually was forced as a 404. I'll, I'll refrain from going over the Ruby magic that's happening on the screen for people that aren't familiar, because um, it's quite a bit of magic. Um, but we can move on to load testing. And this is one of the more interesting use cases I've seen for a proxy server. If you're new to doing load testing, um, this is a good way to get started. If you have some Selenium tests, um, you can actually use a proxy server to capture the traffic from them. And then you can convert that uh, HAR file into a JMeter JMX file. And then you can run that JMX file in JMeter uh, either as is, but most likely it's just a, an, an initial uh, load test that you can then configure. You can make it, you know, use parameters, make it data driven, and do a whole bunch of stuff. But it, it's a lot faster than the alternative way to create JMeter files, which is set up a listener within JMeter, which you first have to figure out how to do because JMeter is very onerous if you've never used it before, and then uh, record a bunch of actions and then hope it all worked. Um, so this actually gives, you could take 10 tests, create 10 JMX files, and then have 10 load tests to start configuring. Pretty cool. So um, for this, you know, proxy server again, um, but the meat of this is we're just capturing uh, the hard traffic, and then we're saving it to a file, and then we have a, a a converter, which converts that file, which I borrowed from uh, a Ruby JMeter uh, example from Flood.io, which is an, a company like BlazeMeter that handles uh, JMeter in the cloud, basically load testing in the cloud. But what an HTTP archive looks like, what the, uh, the Selenium HAR file that gets output is this. Um, this is what it looks like viewing it in the browser. And this is what, uh, when it gets converted to a JMX file, when we open it in JMeter, this is what it looks like. So this was, a Selenium, this was once a Selenium test, now a load testing file. Ta-da. Uh, broken image checking. Probably the last use case for, that I have for proxy server with some additional options as well. Um, there's visual testing, which is something I'll cover as a final tip. But there's actually ways to do uh, broken image checking uh, that don't involve visual testing. The first one is a proxy server. Then you can actually, instead of a proxy server, use an HTTP library. Or you can use JavaScript. And so option one, proxy server. It's very same concept as before with status codes. You're just, um, for this example, we can grab all of the elements that have a tag name of image. So every image on the page. And then we can iterate through all of them and then find which ones actually return a status code of 404 and then check to see if there were any. So basically, check all the images. If any of them have that red X, they should return a 404. And then if they do, then the test will fail. Alternatively, we can use an HTTP library to do the same kind of thing. We can grab all the elements and use an HTTP library to check the status code, which will be a lot faster. <laughs> so uh, I'll cover a little bit some other ideas that you can use an HTTP library for soon. Um, and then, of course, there's JavaScript. You could just get all the uh, elements that are images and check to see what the width is and see if any of them are marked as undefined, which will be, which be the same thing as before, except it's not doing a status code check. 
and the thing I like about this one is it's built, it's like there's nothing external you have to add. It's just JavaScript. It will just work. You don't have to do anything extra. So three options to do the same thing. Um, forgot password. So, um, so end-to-end -end testing of forgot password, probably pretty hard, right? Like you, you go to a website, you forgot your password, and you want to test this, but maybe how do you catch that email? Either you pull it out of the database, or you maybe write something clever that catches it before it reaches the service that sends it out, or whatever it is. But if you end up wanting to do a full end-to-end -end test, um, you can use something like Gmail. And you can use Selenium to trigger the forgot password workflow, and then keep that session alive, and then have um, a third-party library that accesses Gmail through the REST endpoint, and find that email open it, and then grab out whatever it is, that information. It could be username and password, or it can be a, a specific link. And then you can go back to the Selenium session and continue on. So that's pretty much the gist there. Um, and in Ruby, there's a Gmail library. And I'm told in Java, there's one as well. Um, but basically, you can find, you know, in this example, I have to create something that will keep trying to make sure that the email's there, because sometimes it, there's a delay, of course, until the email shows up. And then you, uh, you trigger the forgot password, and then you access the email. And then you, in this example, I'm pulling out uh, from the email body the username and password with regular expressions. And then I'm going to that page to visit the forgot password URL, and then plugging in the new information, and then making sure that I end up in a secure place. A-B testing. OK, I feel like this is a sprint to the finish here. <laughs> so, so let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, because I really want to show you guys a mobile testing robot. Um, so A-B testing. Um, companies do A-B testing all the time. And just for those that don't know what I'm referring to, uh, it's also known as split testing. And it's a simple way to experiment with an application's features uh, to see which changes lead to higher engagement. And so what that typically means is there's somebody that's not you that's changing the behavior of an application, which will likely break your automated tests. And what better way? to d address that than to opt out of A-B tests. So for something like Optimizely, it's a very common uh, software as a service platform that does A-B testing. Um, you can actually uh, opt out of the test. So you always end up getting the same functionality, the control, basically. So in this example, uh, I have this application. It has three different states. One that is the control that's just, if you're not in a test, it's always going to look like this, which is where you want to be. And then there's the other ones. Uh, each and each state has a different text. So the control, the one that always is the same, will be A B test control. The header on these variations, there will be A B test variation one, and there will be one that says no A B test. And so what this looks like is, uh, you forge a cookie, or uh, with it, with Optimizely, you can forge a cookie, or you can query a specific URL. And this way, you get to know the state of the page. And so in this example, I have three different tests. And this one, I go to the home page, I grab the header text, and then I make sure that it's what I expect. It's either uh, going to be A-B test variation one or A-B test control. Because um, I'm going to get one or the other. So 50-50 split between. Uh, and then I forge a cookie, and then I refresh the page, grab the text again, and make sure that I'm outside of the test. So it's no A-B test. Ta-da. Uh, and then ver some variation of these for all of these. So basically, it's testing to make sure that we end up outside of the test. But the idea is the same. Uh, a lot of companies end up building their own A-B testing platform or use some other service. But within all of them, they should have the functionality to be able to opt out. And if you can add that into your test setup, that'll save you a ton of pain uh, in your test runs. Um, downloading a file is probably my favorite um, of all the tips, because I think it's the uh, one of the most contended Best, uh, which way do you do it, whether you do it or not, uh, and if you do it, how do you do it, conversations. That's why there's th three tips written on it. <laughs> and um, so there's three ways. And, and there, uh, there's some that are good, and there's some that are great. Um, so that's a big slide. Um, so yeah, three, so there's basically two different things you could do. You can configure Selenium to download the file to local disk, and then delete the file when you're done. And that's really challenging, um, because it can be easy to do in one browser, but not able to be easily done in another. And the configuration is different for every browser, or not available in some browsers. 
Or you can use an HTTP library, not download the file, perform a head request, get the headers back, and then check them to see if the file exists. Make sure it's not empty, and make sure that it has the correct MIME type. And if you do that, it's an order of magnitude faster and more reliable. So here is what it looks like to configure Firefox to download a file. And this commented out line chunk here is for Chrome. It's all, it's all different. And then don't even get me started on Internet Explorer to do the same thing. Probably can't do it. Um, but there's also all this other stuff you have to think about. Like uh, if it's a PDF, you have to disable the viewer to make sure it doesn't open it in a new tab. And there's a whole litany of things to think about. Not to mention figuring out some structure for generating a uniquely named file and so on and so forth. Um, it's not advisable. Instead, with an HTTP library, you just, do, you just grab the URL of the file that you want. So in this example, I'm just grabbing the href of a link. And then I'm performing a head request. And then I'm just checking the headers. And is this a PDF? And is it not empty? And that's it. And for secure files, of course, you have to pull the session information out of Selenium and then pass it into your HTTP library. Otherwise, you won't be able to access secure files. But when you do this, you get the same benefit. Uh, and in this example, this is just a rack app, so I just grab the rack session out and shove it into, I'm using a REST client in this one. But basically, it's a reliable test, extremely fast. And the only time you'd really want to download files, maybe you'd want to do some sort of check within the file. But really, I haven't found a use case where people need to do anything other than make sure that it lets you download a file and that it is a PDF and that it does contain something. So that's usually good enough. And then if you need to inspect it further, then maybe it's just worth manually testing it. Um, OK, um, these last couple tips um, are things that I think are maybe fun. I'm not sure how practical they are, but maybe they're useful. Um, highlighting elements, um, a way to basically enable um, additional debugging information in failing tests. So in this example, um, I'm using JavaScript to add styling around an element, to add a dashed border around an element. And so when I do that, I can say highlight that element. And what that looks like is this. So if I have a test uh, that's failing, I can turn on maybe this as a debugging option and then run my test and actually see which things it's scoping to and which things it's clicking. All of a sudden, it becomes very obvious what's happening in my tests. And maybe you're like, nah, that's not useful enough. I would love Growl notifications in the browser. <laughs> what better way to know what your tests are doing by having it tell you every single action that's happening. And if you're recording your tests, then you get to know all of that. So fun thing, fun fact, within Selenium, when you actually create an instance of it, you can pass it a listener. And in that listener, you can make it extend the abstract event listener, a lesser known function within Selenium. And that gives you access to all of these actions. Uh, every time some, after Selenium navigates to something, you can make it do something. Same for before it finds something, after it finds something, before it clicks something, after it clicks something. And in this case, we're making sure that we can use this jQuery growl notification. But then we're saying display that I navigated to, the URL I just navigated to, and which element I found, whether or not any of this is happening. And so what that looks like, uh, that's just the JavaScript. It's very boring. Um, what that looks like is a video is this. So if you turn on the debug option, and all of a sudden you have Growl notifications that are actually loading in the DOM. So if you really, really, really wanted to know what's happening for every step of your test, that's one way to do it. And um, so that's all that. Uh, visual testing, I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, and since the laptop's here, it may be hard to really show you. Um, but I think visual testing is really cool. Uh, and if you can configure and use something like Apple Tools and Sauce Labs, it's very much a turnkey process to do visual testing on hard to reach browsers. Um, so maybe it's easier just to tell you about some write-ups I've done. Uh, I've actually given a lot of thought about visual testing in the last uh, four months. And uh, I have a getting started write-up that kind of tells you about all of the open source tools that are available uh, and an example of how to use one of them. And then I have uh, two posts on false positives that you're going to run into with visual testing. And then uh, how you can add visual testing to your existing tests. And of course, if you're doing BDD, how that all fits together as well. Um, and so I think they're worth reading because I wrote them. But then again, <laughs> that's just me. Um, but if you're ever interested and curious about visual testing, and uh, if you only read one post, I would read 
I would read the first one if you're new to visual testing because it just tells you everything that's going on in the ecosystem and gives you an example. Um, so it could show you whether or not you think it's worthwhile. And then as you get further in the weeds, that's, that's the way to go. Just go in order. Um, and I think I'll end with <laughs> a quote from Jason Huggins, the creator of Selenium. His new mantra is, a robot on every desk. You know, there's, uh, with Microsoft, it was a computer on every desk. And now, it's a robot on every desk. And fun fact, um, airport security tends to only confiscate hand tools, not robots. Um, <laughs> so assembling this hurt my thumbs. But other than that, this is a mobile testing robot that Jason Huggins, a creator of Selenium, built with the concept that this will test truly end-to-end -end mobile phone applications. <laughs> And um, so, uh, basically, you would put a phone in here. And this is a grounded stylus that is controlled by three servo motors, which are controlled by an Arduino uh, that plugs into a laptop. And, uh, and he has a demo online of it playing Angry Birds. Uh, and I also have a demo to show of it playing Angry Birds, uh, which might be easier if people want to come up and crowd around just Forgetting it all on video would be tricky. Um, but um, I think it's fascinating. I think the hardware has come a long way. Software, maybe not there yet. Um, but there is early stages of an appium integration. So if you're doing mobile testing and you're like, I want real devices on the cloud or in my grid, you could also connect this to appium and use your appium to drive a tapster bot, which is effectively mimicking a human finger. It just swipes, it taps, all that stuff. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's, uh, it could be where the future's going. And if you talk to Jason Huggins, he says, I live in the future, and this is what's happening right now. <laughs> so um, so it's <laughs> if you're curious, it's called the Tapster Bot. Um, you can build your own. It's entirely 3D printed. And all the designs are open sourced. Uh, and you can get them at this link. Uh, it takes you to the GitHub page, um, which also has the initial uh, the, well, I'll call it very, very initial rudimentary code uh, that ha gives you the ability. It's a Node.js uh, REPL that enables you to pass commands to it. And right now, um, the initial stuff that you'll get is very, very simple, like XYZ coordinates. But you can very easily create your own little uh, key map and make it write some tests and do some stuff. And then um, you could then hook it up to Appium to pull screenshots and then actually do some assertions. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, or you can buy one fully assembled. He does sell them and ship them. Uh, he has shipped them internationally. And yes, there are companies that have actually bought them. Uh, but he's been sworn to secrecy, so I don't think there'll be any case studies anytime soon about the success of it. But um, I think it's fascinating. Um, and uh, I think you should all just check it out. And, uh, fun, and the fun fact is, uh, a few of these parts I actually got printed here in Tel Aviv. Uh, in Jaffa, there is a 3D uh, print lab. And you just go in. I gave them a thumb drive. I said, give me three of these. And they said, OK, come back in half an hour. It's just like getting photos developed. It's fantastic. So uh, worth checking that out. Um, so building your own would be pretty awesome. You get bonus points and geek points. What's that? Uh, yeah, and, and the next model will do pinch and zoom. Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, I'll come back when, when it's perfect. <laughs> so <laughs> probably never, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'll just close. Um, we already saw this, Elemental Selenium. Um, at some point, maybe I'll do something with this and that, and maybe something more with mobile testing. Um, and if you have questions uh, about mobile testing, I'd be happy to offer what information I, I know. Um, and feel free to get in touch, um, please, because I'm on Twitter and email uh, all the time. And I really just want to help people uh, with software testing. And it really helps me to know what questions people have. And a lot of times what happens is someone sends me a question and says, how do I do this? And I go, hmm. And then I think about it. And then I write a 1,000 to 1,500 word blog post about it that demonstrates exactly how to solve it. And then I email back a link. <laughs> so, so if you may be the lucky recipient of that uh, if you send me a question. Or I'll give you my quick thoughts in an email that will maybe help you or point you in the direction of somebody that can help you. Um, so that's my goal. Um, to be the most helpful person in testing. So please get in touch. Uh, and, and that's it. Yes. So I am like way back in the OSB situation with okay. lots and lots and lots of tests. And then you can use like the WebDriver. I hear this is a common thing, but 
I'm finding it daunting. So like, where would you start? Okay, so the question is, you have Selenium RC tests, lots of them, and you need to come to current times with WebDriver. How do you start? And you're using and, and you're using PHP, also challenging. Um, so uh, within the Selenium project, there is um, something called WebDriver backed Selenium, which is meant to be um, a crutch to get you over that initial hump of you have uh, you want to use WebDriver, but you maybe have old Selenium RC uh, API functions, and it helps you kind of at least connect the back end, make sure things work, and then slowly you can go through and chip away at changing things. Um, and the biggest thing, um, the best place to start would probably be the, the post I linked to earlier of um, the talked about a base page object. And um, that's the best thing, uh, that, that's what they used at Google to do this. They used WebDriver back Selenium, and then they had a facade layer for Selenium. And then they, made, then they went through all of their page objects, their page factories, and they made sure that it was using uh, they slowly were chipping away at changing, uh, changing out everything. So they made sure to all use this facade layer, and then they went through and they changed every, all the facade layers, basically. You, then you take WebDriver back Selenium out, and then you basically, you're, you're done. Goodbye, Selenium RC. Yeah, so that's, that's really the, I mean, that's the only recommendation, recommended path I've heard of, and that's why they built WebDriver back Selenium, basically, was to help. It's, it's a separate binary, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. You mentioned the browser of proxy. Mm -hmm. uh, just the other day, I was playing with it, and I just kind of hit a brick wall when I was trying to do HTTPS. Mm, yes. And I wondered whether it's a known workaround. I tried Chrome, and nothing seems to work. Uh, yeah, so with, it, with browser mod proxy, if you're dealing with HTTPS traffic, um, they're, at least in Ruby, uh, I've ran into the same issue. and you need to um, specify an argument that states that you're using HTTPS. It's like an, an extra optional initialization parameter. And then once you do that, like, everything starts working. <laughs> it's just like not, not known and, and kind of, it wasn't really well documented from, my, from what I gathered. Because um, if you look at the browser mob proxy documentation, it's all, here is the REST endpoint, like all the REST APIs to use it. And then, and then like all the supporting libraries, like in Ruby, you have to look at the tests to, to see what's actually happening, how they use it, because the documentation is not very robust. That's, and that's usually the case for any supporting library like that. Uh, yeah, so um, however you're connecting to it. So um, when you create an instance of the proxy, if it's through the REST endpoint, then it would be a, probably an additional um, parameter or some, whatever, an additional request maybe to say that I'm using HTTPS. So something in the initial configuration because to use it, you have to create an instance of it. It's a basically a service that runs, and then you say, give me an instance, and then use it in a test. Because then you can run numerous proxy instances off one browser mob proxy. And so when you create that initial instance, you have to tell it somehow that you're using HTTPS. When it's pure Java or pure REST, I'm not sure, but it should be available as a, in somewhere in the documentation or a test somewhere. But if you get stuck, and maybe you could show me your specific implementation, and I can I can maybe help you kind of find that. Yeah. Yes. Is there a way to see the source of mobile pages? Uh, uh, like if it's a mobile web page or, okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you're using something like Selendroid? Yes. No, aren't you glad we talked earlier? <laughs> so much context. Um, so uh, are you interested in the listing of the elements or an interest, like just so you can figure out what to actually write your test against? Or you want to know the state of the page you're viewing? When you, need to find out, you need to find that button? Uh, yes. There, I, OK, so my working knowledge is in Appium, so I'd have to look at Selendroid to know what the equivalent is. But there, should, there is a way, there should be a way, to list the, uh, the elements and the hierarchy of them on the page like in the application you're testing. So you should be able to say, what are they? And then figure out, oh, that's, that's what's available. I want to try that. And then like in Appium, there's an inspector that actually can show you that too, that highlights things for you. So in Selendroid, I'm assuming there's some equivalent function that you can do to list that. Um, but 
I'm not sure what it would be off the top of my head because um, they're different. Um, I'm assuming they're different APIs, unless they're, they're all written against WebDriver, basically. But so they should have the same functionality, but the API is different. So I don't know what it is. So it should be there. And if it's not, we can maybe send an email to somebody. Um, so yeah, um, take a see if you can find it in the documentation. And if not, send me an email, and I'll see if I can help you out. So, so your question is, if you have an automated test that has found a bug and is failing, what do you do with it? Uh, OK, um, so this is actually a great topic. Uh, and I don't think that, um, I think every company does something different. Some people might just ignore the test. I think it's better to actually tie, like use a category to denote that this found a defect, this found a bug. It's like what you can, it'd be, if you have a list of known bugs in the system and you have a bunch of automated tests that can prove it, and make it repeatable, then it's fantastic because every time you run this suite, they should all fail. You know that's the end condition. And then if the bug is fixed, the test starts passing again. So the goal of having the, so basically you should keep that test and mark it as, like use a category and say defect. And then you have a suite you can run all the time that tracks the, the known defects in the application. And it's fantastic because a, any developer would love for someone to just give them a working repeatable test that they can run as opposed to say, here are the steps to do it. No, no, just here's a test, run it. And then when you're done, you'll know you're done because the test passes. So it's worth keeping um, and just figuring out a way to like say, I want to run just a group of defect tests. Cool. Any other questions? Cool, I think we're good. All right, thanks everybody. This has been great.